Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is Educational Podcasting Today, Episode 50, the podcast that helps you learn a little bit about how to bring podcasting into your classroom and create audio and video with your students. Welcome back to a great time here at TeacherCast. We have been throwing out a lot of great audio and video over on our website. I hope you guys have had a chance to check out Educational Podcasting today. We just launched our TeacherCast Ultimate Guide to Podcasting, which gives you everything that you need to know about how to bring audio and video into your classroom. We are actually working right now on our second version of that, specifically designed on curricular activities. You can check that out over on educationalpodcasting.com. Um, we would love to have you guys check it out, join us, and of course, let us know what you guys think today. I have a fantastic guest on today who is a podcaster and an educator who's focused on using podcasts to help students have a voice, not only in the classroom, but in the world around them. I want to bring on today Mr. Michael Silverstone. Mike, how are you today? Welcome to the program. Hi, Jeffrey. It's great to be here. It is so nice to have you. I'm looking forward to hearing everything about what you guys are doing. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am a uh, writer, a songwriter. A, uh, I've been a teacher for about 20 years, and uh, before, and I teach young children. I teach um, lower elementary, um, grades one through three, mixed ages, and um, uh, near Boston and uh, Newton actually Newton Montessori School and uh, I um, also um, am an author. I've written books for children, uh, nonfiction books, uh, biographies of uh, women who changed the world or um, uh, I've also done some nonfiction topics like Latino baseball and uh, firefighters. Mm -hmm. um, but more recently as a writer I've written about um, uh, educational topics about building community in classrooms and in schools and um, m uh, currently and we've just finished a book um, that's called Raising Student Voices in Diverse Classrooms and it's all about creating the conditions for students to become empowered. I, I love those topics of being able to take your craft that you love so dearly and being able to really express it with your students to help them have a voice. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you're doing in your Montessori school. What, what exactly is that, by the way? A Montessori school is one that um, has a prepared environment that allows children to, to uh, make their own connections to what they're learning through their senses and that they're doing it through their own experience rather than being directed by a, a teacher in front of the room. And, and that's a really neat concept. And I find that there's a lot of schools out there that are looking to give students that voice, give students those directions, but they struggle sometimes in the fact that, you know, students do need teacher direction and to be teacher led, but at the same time, it's how do you change the culture for that, right? The whole idea of a Montessori school is the culture is designed to let the students make their decisions. Yeah, I would agree. And what I found was that um, all I had to do to, to get a podcast with children is um, invite the uh, I, we, we put out a menu of choices, um, and some students went to uh, to do extra recreation. Some did journaling. Some, uh, but uh, I had uh, seven students sign up for podcasting, and when they did, um, we just had a meeting about what topics they wanted to cover and how they wanted to do it, and then, and they had all this knowledge. Of, of how to um, find music on the web that was public domain. They knew how to um, uh, how to announce segments. They knew how to write. They knew how to debate. All I had to do was um, just uh, help them list the um, their goals and give them time to do it. And a lot of it really came from their excitement. Mm-hmm. 
So talk to us a little bit about your podcast. You started a show called First Saturday, a podcast of ideas, music, and writing. And obviously, this is about your background. I see you're a musician. Talk to us a little bit about the show. How did it get started? And uh, what were your, some of your goals for creating this? Um, I knew that there were things that people needed to know about that um, they, they, could, they could discover through um, – hearing the voices of the people doing it. So I, I, there were the very first one that I did was with uh, a gentleman from Amherst, Massachusetts named David Mazur, and he has an organization called Reader to Reader. And it's an extraordinary organization that um, directs books from uh, two areas that are underserved by libraries and bookstores, um, prisons, uh, Native American communities, um, places of high poverty, um, and um, it's it's very life changing um, for the for the people receiving the books, and um, and I knew that his story w- should be told, and I also wanted to know more about his story, so I interviewed him, and I put that out there, and um, just uh, and it went down the list of things I was most fascinated about that I could interview somebody and, and do it. Nice. And, and talk to us a little bit about your recording, right? Many teachers out here are listening to this saying, how do I start this? Is it easy? Do I have to you know, spend a lot of money? Talk to us a little bit about your recording style. Yeah. Um, well, because I'm a musician, I wanted to have a, a, a decent microphone for a laptop recorder. And I don't have a lot of technical skill. So, but I knew how to use uh, GarageBand, um, and I knew how to set levels and multi-track record. Um, so I got a, um, a Yeti um, uh, digital microphone uh, for about $125. Um, and, uh, I, and I had a laptop. And I also um, would also sometimes record on, um, if I'm on like a remote location and I wanted to not bring my whole rig um, use GarageBand or some similar uh, program on an iPad um, and then um, just send those as MP3s and then compile them in uh, GarageBand later. Nice. And it seems like it's very, very easy for you to do with all this stuff. Now, talk to us a little bit about bringing your students into all of this. What are some of the things that, that you feel podcasting can do for students, right? If you give them a microphone, what are some of the possibilities that you see? Um that first of all, it taps into knowledge that they've developed and expertise that they've developed. That's really at a high level Um, that um, some of the students, well, they definitely knew as much or more about um, recording and using these programs and better programs than I even know how to use. and they're a lot quicker at learning them and, and implementing them. And um, it's exciting to to work with them as colleagues, actually. Nice. Um, so that's one thing. And so you've taken this passion for student voice and giving students the ability, and you've turned it into this book that's going to be coming out next year, published by ASCD. That's right. Um, yes. And um, it's co-written with... Um, Dr. Debbie Zakarian, who um, is a uh, noted uh, consultant to schools and, and a trainer, and she's taught at the university level, um, and um, and I'm sort of the the, the voice of the uh, from in the field of a, a teacher voice um, and also an experienced writer. So that our partnership um, on this book, uh, we were committed to the idea of kind of going against the current trend of um, of having students controlled by uh, standardization um, and and having them uh, be able to how to create the conditions in a classroom where where, where you, through creating community creating interdependence um, students come into a sense that they're not waiting for someone to tell them what to do but that as a community, we can empower each other and, um, and also uh, not just wait for directions, but 
um, see what we're inspired to give to each other and, um, and, and discover and become. How much of your writing life, your podcasting life, how much do you bring into the classroom, right? So many teachers struggle with having a wonderful in the classroom activity life and stuff like that. And then they do all this stuff outside, but they, they always have a hard time kind of merging these kind of worlds. Uh Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing with your kids. You, do they know that you're doing the podcast and that you're writing a book or do you keep these things separate? Um, Well, the way that they come together is that, um, I have an unusual sort of practice that I've had for a really long time. This is, I, I usually wake up, I wake up at uh, 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I go to bed early. I go to bed 8.30 or 9.30. And um, when I wake up at 4, the first thing that I do is I write in a journal. And um, I'm not always writing purposefully for publication but really to to contact what it is that I'm most interested in. I mean, I'm trying to develop, I've developed my own voice. And I've I've done this over, uh, when I was an undergraduate in in, uh, studying writing at Columbia University, um, I started this practice of writing five pages a day in a journal, um, these little black and red uh, Esselite books. And I I have I buy twelve every year, and I've done that since uh, nineteen eighty two. Um, I'm about to buy another twelve for this year. Uh-huh. Um, so that uh, essential practice of well, first of all, having a time that's not um, it's like I have these four hours or three or three hours every day that is not my teacher identity, and it's not even my writing identity, but it's an it's a uh, personal. Uh, a time of reflection and introspection and expression. And from that is the seeds of ideas and visions of, of things that could happen that um, I'm excited about. And, and I, and I find a way to get those ideas into the school day. And, um, and I get sort of long-term ideas of things that are possible that I wouldn't if I was just in a sort of standard transactional, what do I have to do to get through this school year idea? Right. Now, now let's kind of jump back a little bit into you working with your students, because the whole idea of the the Montessori idea, again, is, you know, students having that opportunity to make those decisions, right? Uh How do you do that? Like if I was a teacher and I wanted to create a, a learning environment, a classroom, or even if I was an administrator and I wanted to have a, you know, a building where it was more student choice, student based, what mm-hmm. advice would you have for anybody listening today that's sitting there going, all right, I get it. I see it. There's a culture there. But how do I make that first step into moving my classroom building towards that culture? Mm-hmm. Well, as an institution, um, what my school does is... Um, they have two opportunities to give kids experiences that they want to provide on a regular basis. So one of them is once a month, it's called focus Friday. And what will happen is um, the older students will create ideas of, of um, workshops that they want to offer to um, other, to other students and out of their passions and interests. And um, sometimes it's, teachers doing that, but, but just as often it's the older students. And, um, and this is something interests that are, you know, sometimes that they, they are academic, but, um, just as often they're, they're things that, um, they may be craft projects or they may be, um, uh, building or engineering or, um, it's just, they're, they're various. So the, the, the once a month uh, optional class created by students um, opportunity um, creates a culture of that. There's also um, uh, the way that we do recess at our school is three days is sort of standard recess out, outside. Um, two days are uh, called interest groups. And each month we, we offer a menu of um, different options um, offered by teachers out of their passions and interests, um, and um, students sign up for it. And 
often students develop an interest in something that they didn't even know about. So there might be a yoga, uh, a wiffle ball, a um, life drawing, um, a maker space uh, design, and, um, and, and those, change, those are offered every month. So because the, those two things are ongoing, um, students are aware. I mean, there's, there's a culture of um, valuing and honoring and exploring uh, activities that are done for their intrinsic interest rather than um, for, uh, you know, some uh, externally recognized uh, goal uh, or to burnish your uh, application to college or something. It's more like, what do, what do you love? And, uh, and how do you connect to that as often as possible in the school week? So we know a little bit more about how to start this, but take me from the point of view of the student, right? Like, let's say that I'm in a traditional public school right now and I get moved into a Montessori school. And now suddenly, in, instead of it being teacher led, it's, hey, what do you want to do today? How, mm-hmm. does this, how do the students handle the transition or how do the students handle that uh, sudden impact of responsibility that they have to make their own decisions? Mm-hmm. Well, there's... There's lots of tools that you, you can offer students that will give them the capacity for self-direction. So some of these are, I mean, they're, they're just sort of simple structural things, a work plan that you consult or a regular time that you meet with teacher as an advisor to reflect on what your goals are, how you're meeting them, what's going well, how you can problem solve. So that you start to um, consult with them, at, you know, and respectfully as, as uh, students that are going about their work as professionals would. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, so that's one way. Um, but another way is, um, or other aspects of this, is that um, you have to invest time in creating a community of, of, of interdependence and mutual responsibility. And um, interdependence meaning being able to, I mean, one thing that we do in Montessori is we have limited materials that are used by everybody, which uh, causes you to have to negotiate socially. Um, how do you take turns? How do you take the proper amount of time and um, consider the needs of others? Um, how do you work side by side with lots of people and, and control your own and, mm-hmm. and focus so that you're contributing to an environment where concentration can happen so that it, it's a it's a uh, a social organization that 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 establishes its own equilibrium. And um, but there's 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 time honored methods to creating that. And uh, it's uh, uh uh, they call it normalization. Oh, uh, and so there's a there's like in the course of a year, usually it takes about a half a year for for a class for a class to um, for students in it to um, be choosing their own uh, work with a sense of not waiting to be told what to do or not testing the limits, but um, with a certain contentment for being able to be in a state of uh, absorption, of, uh, of doing tasks that are interesting but not too hard and, uh, not, uh, and interesting enough to be expanding their capacities all the time. They're in the flow state of just right um, learning. And these are all skills that any teacher out there who wants to bring in some kind of a, a group project or a podcasting project, these are skills that anybody out there that you know can bring into their schools. And that's why I love talking about audio and video and, and all the different podcasting topics, because really when you're bringing these kinds of programs into your school and doing these types of projects, it is all about helping having the students understand that, you know, A, they can make their decisions, B, Let's put ourselves in the right frame of mind before we hit that record button as we're planning everything, giving them the opportunity to really put their best foot forward and create a great product that can then be shared with others. Yeah, there's um, a phenomenon I often note with uh, 
uh, school plays or any kind of performance or showcase thing, which is that it starts and with um, a fair amount of chaos, and um, it as it nears the presentation time, students get really serious about wanting it to be good, and um, as they do that, they raise their game, and they also um, they they end up achieving more than they knew they could, and um, it's really always exciting to see things come together. Um, because they have the purpose of, um, you know, they're making something for an audience and they're making something to communicate something that's important to them. And um, it's just a really um, powerful motive for um, ad advancing skill and, and realizing capacities you didn't know you had at, with other people. Oh, absolutely. Now, there might be people out there who are trying to figure out how do I learn more about this? How do we get in touch with you? So that way, maybe we can bring in some of these Montessori concepts into our schools and into our classrooms. Mike, what's the best way to do that? Um, well, there's a couple ways. One is um, um, I work with, uh, as a, uh, on the staff of the Montessori Elementary Education Teacher Training Collaborative. So um, my uh, email address there is msilverstone at mettc.org. And um, so if you want to learn about Montessori education, um, that's really one of the preeminent um, training institutes um, for elementary uh, Montessori teachers in the country. It's in Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, so that's one way. Um, uh, yeah, and I can also, I'm, I'm ha very happy to, uh, share my experience and um, uh, and offer advice and encouragement to anybody who wants to try this. I also want to emphasize that um, I didn't. It wasn't like I, I I jumped in and was excited to see what would happen when I did it, and I started asking people. And you can self empower yourself by jumping, and you don't have to know what you're doing when you start, and it will organize itself more brilliantly than you expected just because um, when you're working with kids and you want to make sure that they get a product that's complete, you will do what you need to um, and you'll find a way and they'll, they will help you because they're uh, really adept at um, using technology and excited to do it. That's awesome. I, I'm, I, I, there, there's a lot of things that I'm thinking about right now, not only in the classroom, but you know, as the father of five-year-olds coming up here is like, how do you let them explore, experience, have their own voice and what they, you know, and what we do in normal family life, yet still provide the structure and give them the ability to rise and fall when needed. There's, I'd love to ex explore this topic a little bit more as we, as we kind of go through and, you know, Mike, please invite yourself back on it uh, next year. You said your book is going to be coming out and, and, you know, we've got a very good relationship here with ASCD. So I'm looking forward to having you and your co-author come back on uh, next year to do this. Oh, that would be great. We'd love to do that. And we encourage you guys to try out new things, especially in your classroom. If you guys are looking to bring podcasting or do any kind of audio and video, we've got a ton of resources over on educationalpodcasting.com. And of course, while you're there, check out our brand new ultimate guide to podcasting. Talks about everything from how to plan, record, edit, publish, promote, and then what? And we do get into some of the great things that you can do in school. Please check it out over at Educational Podcasting Today. And of course, you can check us out on Twitter at Podcasting Today. Mike, I'm going to leave it with you. Are there any last minute um, words of advice that you would have to anybody who's looking to get into podcasting, looking to do something a little bit different with their students this year? Um, just that students are looking for authentic ways to um, to to get their ideas expressed and shared. And um, that energy is going to really um, be able to help you uh, support them. Um, and if you can just, you know, connect to that, you will find, you'll get over the, obst the technical obstacles, which are really minimal once you get into it. I couldn't say that better myself. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time today. This is Educational Podcasting Today, episode number 50. 
We love it that you guys have spent 50 episodes with us, and I hope you guys are enjoying the journey. We're looking forward, forward to another great 50 episodes. And on behalf of Michael here and everybody here on the Teacher Cast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you to keep up the great work in your classroom and continue sharing your passions with your students.